This is the Snapmaker U1 Tool Changer. And if you're watching this video, the odds are you're one of the 17,000 people that backed this thing on Kickstarter. Or you're one of those that are on the sidelines currently trying to weigh your choices and make a decision about whether you should pledge or pass. And if you have backed it, you might be having second thoughts because they're about to collect your money in just a few days. So now's your chance to make a final decision. And as one of the few people that has this machine, I'm uniquely well equipped at this point in time to give you some perspectives on my opinion, at least, whether I would back this machine. Now, I've already produced two videos about the U1. I will link them down below. Those were both highly produced with lots of nice B-roll showing all of these beautiful prints and talking about my experience in more detail. This video is just gonna be a bit of an unscripted hot take on how I feel about this at this current point in time, given about a month, maybe a month and a half of testing and evaluation. Now, the first couple of weeks of that period of time, this machine was not operational. That's because it was dead on arrival. But that did give me the unique insight into the repairability of this machine, which I'll touch on a little bit later. So if you pledge for the early bird, you're gonna get your machine mid-December, roughly, according to Snapmaker. If you pledge a little bit later than the early bird, you're gonna get your machine in mid-January. And if you're one of the later backers, you're not gonna get your machine until March of 2026. Now with any Kickstarter, there's risks, obviously. I think it's safe to say you're going to get a printer. The question is, is that printer still going to be competitive and relevant in the market when you receive it? Now that's not always a given. If we look at some of the other recent 3D printing Kickstarters or just maker tech Kickstarters, we've seen that timelines tend to slip and when you get the product eventually, sometimes it's not as relevant as it used to be. I'm thinking specifically about the Frozen Arco. That printer Kickstarter campaign ended quite a long time ago and I think they maybe just started shipping to backers. And back then it was pretty intriguing because it was a big printer, it was heated chamber and it had a multi-color unit. Basically everything that Bamboo was doing well, but make it a little bit bigger, make it a little bit more open source. So there was a lot of interest in that. Fast forward to today, uh, so much has changed in the industry. So many new printers on the market that Anybody that backed that campaign, I think they'd probably be having a little bit of buyer's remorse now, given how quickly things tend to change. Uh, with this, if you did get in on that early bird, by the time you get this machine in December, I think there's a fairly good chance it's still going to be relevant. Um, it's not that far off. But I do want to put in context the fact that there's also a lot of other companies that have caught on to what is required to be competitive in today's 3D printing market landscape. If we look back to Bamboo and their campaign, when that first came out, that was disruptive. I don't think anybody saw that coming, and therefore they had quite a long runway to stay on top of the market and keep their product competitive. And anybody that backed that campaign, they shipped on time, they got the printer, and it was relevant for a long time. Uh, I mean, the X1 Carbon is still kind of relevant in the market. It's just getting to the point where, yeah, you probably shouldn't buy it. You should just buy like a P1S or, um, you know, maybe a quality printer or something other than that. It's not the best value printer in the market today, but when it shipped, yeah, it was still a good option. And I don't think anybody would have regretted backing that campaign. We look at say the Eufy Make E1, I believe it's called. That's the biggest Kickstarter campaign to date. Way more popular than I'm sure they anticipated. Um, and so there's some fulfillment issues. They've slipped on their timeline. It's now been pushed back by a few months. I think when that finally does ship to backers, Again, it'll be like Bamboo, it'll still be highly relevant because there's nobody else really doing what they're doing, as far as we know right now. But what we can say with this guy, for any of those kind of late stage backers that aren't going to get the printer until March, a lot can change in that period of time. And there's already a lot of people that have caught on to what Snapmaker has done, and really what the industry trend was. Snapmaker really just put two and two together. They saw how successful Bamboo was, and how excited people were for multicolor printing. And they saw how expensive the solution from Prusa was with the XL. And they basically just added that up, did the math and said, hey, we can make a lot of money if we give people a multicolor printer that's efficient and affordable. And that's exactly what they did. But Snapmaker obviously is not alone in drawing that conclusion. There's a lot of other companies that are also working on their own solutions. We've seen Prusa tease their indexed 
integration with the Core One. We've seen, of course, Bamboo, their somewhat knee-jerk release of the Bamboo H2C, or at least the announcement of the H2C. Both of those announcements from Prusa and Bamboo seemingly in response to the wildly popular Snapmaker U1 Kickstarter. Now think of all the other companies that are kind of in the shadows and haven't yet put forth what they're doing. Think of Creality. There's a good chance they came out with something similar. Maybe they get it to market sooner. I wouldn't think it would be necessarily cheaper than this, but it's probably going to be cost competitive. So depending on when you get this printer, it may or may not still be relevant. I mean, I think it's fa fair to say that it is going to be, uh, but it's not a given when you back something on Kickstarter. So you do need to bear that in mind, especially if you're one of those late stage backers that won't get the printer until March. So let's say you do decide to keep your pledge or uh, you're choosing to create a new pledge. You obviously want to do so under the impression that this is a good, solid workhorse printer. At face value, yeah, super intriguing, right? Multicolor, multi-material, efficient with very low waste and at a reasonable price point, incredibly reasonable price point. Now, as somebody that's actually tested this firsthand, what is my experience? So I want to go through sort of some of the pros and cons uh, over my time testing this thing. And I'm going to tell you whether I personally would back this machine uh, if I didn't happen to already have one. So I did post two videos, like I said. The first one was about the repairability of this printer because it was dead on arrival. Dead on arrival, not usually a good sign, but it did give me the chance to evaluate the repairability. Uh, and I deemed it to be very much repairable. It was pretty easy to get in there and get access to all the electronics, everything that I needed to do. Um, and Snapmaker support was, was helpful in, in getting me back up and running. So those are all good signs. And the comparison I made was to bamboo printers. And I have some experience repairing those and they are much more difficult. So even though I wasn't able to actually print anything in that first video, I was able to get some unique insights that uh, I didn't see anywhere else. So Check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, I'm gonna come back to that later on in the pros and cons. But for now, let's talk about the second video, which was the printing video, the Snapmaker U1 experiments. And that's when I printed all of these lovely models here. The results from that were overall very favorable. I performed that exact, well, not the exact same set of experiments, but a very similar structure of experiments on the Proust Excel. I was an early adopter of that printer, paid full retail price for it, tried to do the same sort of thing, produced a video of that. I will put that link in the description also. I have to say that the results I got out of the Snapmaker U1 with very little tuning were orders of magnitude better than I got with my day one Prusa XL. And I am a beta tester of this machine, so I did expect it to be a little rough around the edges, and it was, as, as we saw. But the results I got out of it were frankly, quite impressive. There were some issues here and there, which, which we'll touch on, but I was very pleased with what we got out of it. We did some multicolor prints, dual color PLA. We did some multi-material prints, PLA and TPU. We did some abrasive engineering grade materials like carbon fiber PET using a support material for easy support release. And overall, we just stress tested the machine and found out what it can do well and what it does less well. So let's just go overall pros and cons here, just so you can get a summary of what I liked and what I did. So of course, the biggest pro is the price. At this price, it's gonna be really difficult for the market to keep up. Any of those filament purging solutions that are on the market currently for around the same price as this, I will not recommend anybody buy that going forward once this machine is available regular retail. Why would you purge a bunch of material and waste a bunch of time when you could just do it much more efficiently for around the same price? Technology and capabilities. So that kind of goes off of that same topic. The tool changer, it's a different mindset. When you're slicing for a tool changer printer, you're not hesitating to arrange a bunch of parts on the same build plate and print them all at the same time. There's really no loss or, or no cost associated with printing two parts next to each other that are completely different colors, different materials, because the filament changing time or the tool changing time is so minimal. With those single nozzle multicolor printers, you are second guessing whether you're putting a pink part next to a black part, 
because you don't want to have color bleed and you don't want to waste time purging every layer to print those two things at the same time. With a tool changer, you don't have that same trade-off, so you don't even need to think about that. Now, what about the user experience? So UI and UX. That starts right off with the calibration. You've got all of your tool head dock positions pre-calibrated from factory, so you don't need to recalibrate those, which is something you do need to do on the Prusa XL. The calibration for the tool offsets is done using a feature in the bed, so you don't need to install a pin and then remove it. And then once you're up and running, you have some quality of life conveniences that you don't have uh, on some of those other printers. So you have filament auto loading, and then you also have uh, a loading sequence that's initiated on the screen here to auto load all of your tools, purge them, wipe them, and move on. So they've definitely thought about the user experience and how quick a user can get up and running with a new print on this printer. And you even get some nice video graphics on the screen every once in a while uh, showing you how to do certain operations. Now, one of the other pros in my books is the upgradability. So they've already come out with some hardened nozzles that you can add to your Kickstarter pledge. They have an enclosure or a top lid that they're working on. So compatibility with engineering grade materials is just a few upgrades away. Now, there is an active heating, which is a bit of a disappointment. So you're not going to be printing super high temp engineering grade materials. Um, but it is nice to have at least a draft free environment to keep some of that heat in. Now repairability, I went through that in detail, like I said, in that first video. But one thing I didn't mention is the carbon rods. One of the big concerns with the X1C was the fact that those carbon rods might wear and wouldn't be replaceable because they're permanently fixed or glued into place. So what Snapmaker has done here is they've actually given us access ports to unscrew the gantry and get those carbon rods out. So if the panel is off the side of the printer, you can see if you put the gantry right about this position, you can actually get in there and unscrew the fixture blocks that hold the X gantry, and you could get in there and replace the carbon rods. When you're buying a new printer, you're not necessarily thinking of it breaking down. You just assume it's going to work. But these things do break down, and when they do break down, you're going to be very frustrated if they're not easy to repair. And I was able to fix a pretty fundamental flaw by switching out some of the electronics. That same repair on a bamboo printer would be much more difficult. Now let's talk about the firmware. So this is running Clipper firmware, which at first I was really excited to see. Now open source firmware is kind of a double-edged sword. In the 3D printing community, we don't like walled gardens. A lot of people are upset with Bamboo for locking down their firmware, but you have to hand it to them for the fact that their firmware, for the most part, just works. You don't get random error codes or things you don't know how to deal with. This printer, given that it's running Clipper, great that we can get in there and modify the firmware files if necessary. Um, but for the end user, when those faults permeate upwards to the UI and you get some error code that you've not seen before, for a new user, that would be quite confusing and probably leave a bad taste in your mouth when you're using this machine. And here we are, the cons section. So a DOA beta unit, that's my biggest con right off the top. I've seen some of Snapmaker's videos illustrating their QC process and it looks incredibly thorough. So how this DOA unit got into the hands of a reviewer, I don't know. Oftentimes, companies will cherry pick review units and pick the cream of the crop to send to a reviewer. So not only was it DOA with an electrical fault, um, it also had an issue with the bed mount, where the bed was like super loose and wobbly on the mounts. So I had to take that apart and tighten it back up. And one of the blocks for that bed mount was stripped completely, so I couldn't even fully tighten it. And when I did put it back together and I looked at the bed mesh in Clipper, I had this super slanted mesh and I thought I was going to have to kind of manually level it to get it evened out. But ultimately, I just hit print and it was fine. The first layer of compensation did its job. And we got a good first layer. This is kind of an example of what you don't know won't hurt you. On bamboo printers, you don't have access to that information, so you just don't worry about it. But in this case, even with a two millimeter deviation over the course of the bed, I got a perfectly fine first layer. Um, so both of those issues for, for QC, not super reassuring, but hopefully they've, they've taken what I've told them and what other beta testers have told them, and they've put that feedback in action to improve the product and improve their QC processes going forward. And in fact, I know they have done that because they asked for the electronics back that came out of this machine so they could do a post-mortem analysis. So I thought that was definitely nice to see. Also on the list of cons is the spool holders. Again, I talked at length about this in the experiments video, but I talked about how the spools would just fall off when I was printing, and occasionally it would catch the failure and allow me to resume, and other times the print would be lost because 
the filament would break and it would resume, but have you know a layer shift or some missed extrusion. Um, the spool holder is definitely not my favorite. They're not versatile enough to fit all spool types. Some fit really nice and snug, and others just fall right off. In the grand scheme of things, that's a pretty minor complaint. You could print some adapters. You could uh, replace these if you wanted to. Yeah, you can just pull them off, uh, print a new one if you feel so inclined. Now, as far as longevity is concerned, repairability, we already mentioned, is good. But we don't want to be repairing our printer all the time. If certain components wear prematurely, that's not a good thing. So the one wear issue I noticed is the nozzle scrubbers. So those are silicone brushes. And one of them, at least one of them, is completely disintegrated over the course of just a few prints. But SatMaker is aware of this, and I believe they are addressing it. So hopefully that is a non-issue when you receive your machine. The other thing is the Poco pins. So you've maybe heard some reviewers talk about that. Poco pins are rated for a finite number of cycles. So you're making an electrical connection every time you pick up a new tool in order to energize the part cooling fan on the front of the tool head. Contrast that with the Prusa XL, which is a completely passive mechanical system with no electronics on the tool carrier. All the electronics are in the tools. But that means each tool has its own part cooling fan, which adds cost. But with the Snapmaker, because we are making that electrical connection every time we pick up a new tool, you can have thousands of tool changes over the course of a single print. And if these Pogo pins are only rated for between 10 and 50,000 cycles on average, you might see those wear out eventually and need to be replaced. Um, that would be my one concern, and I don't have an answer on how long those are really going to last. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. As long as the replacement parts are reasonably priced, I'm not too concerned about it personally. But longevity is definitely something to consider um, as far as those aspects are concerned. OK, now let's look back to the firmware. I put open source firmware as a pro, but it's also going to be a con. Because the current version of Clipper that they're running has not been re-released in its open source form. They haven't put back the source code with their modifications. They have committed to doing so, and they are obliged to do so by the Clipper licensing. They've committed to do that, I believe, in October when the first printers ship. So that's good to see. We definitely need that. Um, and it's going to make community support for this printer much easier. But what they are not necessarily obliged to do, as far as I'm aware, is release SSH access. So the ability to get into a terminal and to root this printer, so far, they don't have those credentials publicly available. And that means you can't do certain things. I couldn't get in and run the scripts to generate the shaper graphs for the input shaping results. And you couldn't run a command line script to open up a tunnel to put this printer on one of those print farm management software solutions either. So in conclusion, yes, I like this printer. Yes, I think it has a lot of potential. Yes, I think you maybe need to think twice uh, about putting your money behind a Kickstarter, especially if it's not going to ship for a few months and you don't know how the market's going to change in the meantime. So would I back this machine? Yes, if I needed more 3D printers, but I definitely do not. But if you'd like to back this machine, you can do so using the link below. It helps out the channel if you decide to use my link. I appreciate it. But at any rate, I hope you enjoyed this sort of ranty video talking about my experience with the Snapmaker U1. If you did, make sure to give it a like and leave a comment down below. Let me know if you got in on this thing or if uh, you're holding out to see what one of the competitors comes up with. My name's Taylor, this is YGK3D, and until next time, happy 3D printing.